thanks guys for being here tonight. You can all hear me, right? Okay. Voice is a little bit rough, so hopefully it'll last. But <clears throat> so this is really one of the most amazing studies that I've ever done of the Bible. Um, you know, it's going to be on the Star of Bethlehem. You can see in the title slide there. You know, we're going to be looking at astronomy and historical evidence as well as biblical prophecy, and we want to see how all those things all come together and 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 make what I think was the Star of Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. So it's a pretty, pretty neat thing. Um, <clears throat> just to give you a little background how this study got started. You know, I'm an aerospace engineer. I currently work for NASA, but I've worked a lot in defense as well. Um, and primarily spent my career doing uh, or developing guidance systems for, for various rockets. And about 20 years ago, um, I was working on a particular system that has what's called a star tracker on it. You can kind of see there in that little graphic. Um, and basically, it, it's a, a type of camera that looks out and sees the stars and the planets and the moons and things, and, and it navigates by those stars. And on board the rocket itself, it has a, a software that's running, and that's what I worked on at the time, was an estimator of where those planets and stars would be that the rocket should see. And any error between that and what the star tracker said, it used that to, to correct its course. So during mission planning type, type uh, scenarios, you know, we would uh, always look for about three years or so for, for a mission in the future, and I would always propagate forward in time to where the stars and planets and celestial objects should be. But it had finally occurred to me, okay, there's nothing wrong with being able to go back in time as well. The equations all are the same. And so maybe I could even go back 2,000 years and see something related to the star Bethlehem. And so I set out to do that and modified the software I had to go and search during that time frame. I didn't know if it was 1 AD, 1 BC, or, or just whatever. But, and I found some things that were kind of intriguing, but it, I couldn't really put my finger on it at the time. So it took a lot of years. I mean, it, I've been working on, on this pretty much about 15 years or so. Uh, and that's the presentation you're going to see today. Um, and I just, over time, just put together pieces of the puzzle. So it's a, a kind of a culmination of, of a lot of different things. Um, and the main purpose of this study that I want you to come, come away with is not just some fun facts about the star, but that we can press scripture really hard. Because we're going to be using, you know, for the astronomy part, we're going to be using some latest uh, astronomy software. We're going to look at biblical prophecy. You know, one in particular in Daniel chapter 9 that was written 500 years before Christ was even born, and yet it predicts to the exact day when he would be crucified. And we'll mathematically show you how to calculate that. So some pretty impressive things that you can press scripture that hard, especially, you know, 2,000 years in our modern age, and it doesn't break. You know, that's, that's pretty, pretty, pretty neat. And so if you can trust scripture for the things that we can kind of discern with our own, you know, physical world and our own mind, you know, we can, should be able to, to trust what God's word says about, uh, you know, the faith and spiritual things. Before we get right into it, let me just show you the software we're going to use. <clears throat> So this is a, a program called Starry Night, and it's just a commercially available piece of software, and it's a 3D representation of the sky. Uh, you can see a real-time clock is ticking right here with today's date and time and a location. We're near Huntsville. And <clears throat> if we were to go outside right now, if it wasn't cloudy, you'd be able to see this exact uh, star representation in the sky, very accurate. It's within one arc second of accuracy, which is one thirty-six hundredth of a degree. So extremely accurate. Um, and for example, like this is the Polaris star, and if you can, I don't know if you can see that, that resolution, but the altitude and, and azimuth angles are, are ticking off there uh, in that display, and that's because the Earth is moving. Um, so, so the, the as time ticks off, so does the the, mo the motion of the planets and, and and everything else. So it's very very accurate. So this is what we're going to be using uh, to look at uh, the star of Bethlehem. And of course, the star wasn't here in Huntsville. It was in you know, Bethlehem and Jerusalem and, and ultimately Babylon where it first started. So just to give an example of how you can use this, <clears throat> I'm going to use myself as an example. I was actually born in Japan. My dad was in the military uh, in Okinawa in the city of Osaka. So I'm going to use my birth date as an example. It's always starting to get more embarrassing to show that, but older I get. Um, but I was born in 1968 on April 9th, 
And then according to my mom, it was about 2 a.m. in the morning. So here we are in location of Osaka, Japan at 2 a.m. on April 9, 1968, the day that I was born. So if my parents would have walked outside the hospital and looked up at the sky, this is exactly you know, what they would have seen. The, you know, the moon was exactly in this phase, in this position, all these stars at the same place. So we're going to be doing the same uh, method when we go to Babylon 2,000 years ago and to Jerusalem and Bethlehem. So very powerful piece of software. You know, NASA uses this software for mission planning purposes. So pretty neat uh, uh, thing. Um, one of the neat things about the Bible, too, is I always kind of look at it as like an onion because it has various layers. You know, you, you read a surface uh, reading of the Bible and you get one aspect of it, but if you start digging down into the Greek and the Hebrew meanings and use uh, Bible dictionaries and things to help you understand things, you get you know a, a different picture or a more detailed picture. And that's kind of what this, this, this scripture is, or this, this presentation is. And you would think after all these years, you would be able to easily disprove the Bible. I mean, it's you know written over thousands of years, you know, 66 books, 40 different authors. You just think there'd be a bunch of mythology and things like that that'd be easily disproven in these days and time. Um, but nothing's ever been disproven, which is pretty amazing. And when we look at other cultures, you know, these are the ancient Greeks around 700 B.C., and they believed that the god Atlas held up the world. You know, and these guys, the Greeks, you know, they were known as the smart people. That's where we got some of our science methodologies from. So, so they believe this. Uh, the Hindus, you know, they believe that the world was held up by elephants standing on the back of a turtle, even up into the 1800s. So very... Uh, very different from what reality is. But then we look at God's Word. You know, Job is known for, for being the oldest book of the Bible, written around 4,000 years ago. And you see this verse here, he suspends the earth over nothing. I mean, it's not necessarily very specific, but it's certainly not wrong. And, you know, they didn't have this viewpoint. We, we can see in these modern day, these kind of pictures and think, oh, well, yeah, sure. But, you know, back then, they didn't, they didn't know about this. So pretty, pretty amazing. So just to give you a little background on how uh, the star and, and, and event, you know, it's one of the first people that started investigating the star was this guy, Johannes Kepler, um, and his, one of his counterparts, uh, Tycho Bray. Uh, and Tycho, he was known as Prince of the Astronomers. He, he uh, had very uh, extensive databases of, of where he thought the, the, the planets and the stars were. Um, and actually, they didn't even know they were planets. You know, the, the word planet it comes from the Greek planetes, which means wandering star. So all they knew is that they moved more than the other fixed stars in the background. But they were trying to figure out what were the equations of motion that allowed them to calculate how those, those objects moved. So Tycho, he had this database where they didn't have telescopes either. So they were just, by the naked eye, he kept, tra tra kept track of all these objects in the night sky every day. And Kepler, he was trying to come up with these, these equations, and he needed uh, the data from Tycho. Unfortunately, they fought like cats and dogs. They weren't, Tycho was not a very nice, nice guy. And he wouldn't give Kepler but just a little bit of the data. He just kind of dribbled it out to him. Unfortunately for Tycho, he, he died unexpectedly. And then all this data was given to Kepler. And within a matter of months, Kepler had the equations of motion figured out. And that software I just showed you, uh, down in the, in, the, in the bowels of it is actually the Kepler's equations that are still used today. So Kepler realized, okay, he can calculate the positions of those, th those objects in the sky uh, at his current time as well as in the past or, or in the future. And so he had this fascination with the star of Bethlehem and decided he wanted to try uh, his hand at, at finding it. And he was going to use, um, you know, he had to have a date. Okay, when does he look for the star of Bethlehem? He didn't have a fancy computer like I've got that can do millions and millions of calculations per second. He had to do everything by hand. So he had to know pretty precisely when he would be calculating things. And he used uh, historical records from this guy, Flavius Josephus. He was a Jewish historian around the first century. And he recorded in his manuscripts the death of Herod. Because if you remember in the story, you know, he, Herod uh, you know, ordered the babies two years and younger to be killed. And then it says in the scripture that he died shortly thereafter. So if you know when Herod died, you kind of know pretty close to when Jesus would have been born. And unfortunately, uh, the version that Kepler was using had a 4 BC date for Herod's death. 
And that was a typesetting error that had kind of creeped into the manuscripts. And so, unfortunately, Kepler never even found the Star of Bethlehem. But for our modern times, we, we realized that the earlier manuscripts that Josephus had had a 1 BC date. So once you took that into account, then the, the sky really opens up. So we'll start with, uh, in the beginning uh, of this uh, star procession, starts with Gabriel talking to Mary. And in Luke chapter 1, we see, in the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, to a town in Galilee, to, be, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. It says, you will be with child and give birth to a son. So there's a couple things here. Um, <clears throat> one thing Gabriel says, you will be with child, which means... Uh, gives that connotation that not quite yet, but in the near future, you're going to be uh, with a child. And then it also says in the sixth month. So that gives us a real good uh, indication of, of time. Um, the thing to, to recognize, though, when it says the sixth month, that's not talking about our calendar. That's going to be talking about a Hebrew calendar. And so if you see in this table here, we have the, a list of the, of the months of the Hebrew calendar here on the left with our calendar on the right. And they don't match up exactly because the Hebrew calendar is a lunar calendar, so from new moon to full moon, whereas the uh, Gregorian calendar, which is what we use, has this uh, solar uh, calendar, so it doesn't quite match up. But if we, if we read this in the sixth month, well, that's the month of the Lul in, in the Hebrew calendar, so that's around the September time frame is when uh, Mary would be with child. Well, if you fast forward nine months, then you get to this month of Sivan, and so that would have been around the birth time of Jesus would have been in the month of June. So you can see right away that Jesus wasn't, wasn't uh, born in, in December. He was born in June. Um, and there's reasons for we celebrate Christmas in December. We'll talk about that in a minute. But, but Jesus would have been born around the June time frame, and we're going to show more evidence for that. <clears throat> so there's two primary scriptures that are typical for our, the Christmas story. There's this one here in Luke chapter 2, and then there's another one we'll look at in Matthew chapter 2. It's a little wordy, but I think it, it warrants a reading for sure. So Luke chapter 2, and it says, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night, and lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you this day is born in uh, the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with a, an angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God, and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill towards men. And it came to pass, as the angels were going away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad and saying what was told to them concerning the child. And all that heard it wondered at those things which were told by, by them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, and it was told unto them. So there's some key words here that we see. We see manger and shepherds and babe. <clears throat> and that word babe, if you look at that weapon in the Greek, that's brephos, which means infant. So all those uh, descriptions seem very uh, common to what we normally would think about in the Christ Christmas story. But now let's contrast that with Matthew chapter 2. It says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. And when Herod had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where the Christ should be born. 
And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And now, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not thou the least among the princes of Judah, for out of, the, out of thee shall come a governor, and that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star had appeared. That's kind of a key, uh, a key evidence right there. He had to ask. He didn't know uh, anything about the star. And it says, And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him. And when they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the, talk, the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. So now we see some different characters here. We don't see shepherds anymore. We see wise men, and we see young child instead of babe. And if you look up that Greek word for young child, it's no longer brephos, it's pation, which means toddler. And then you also don't see manger anymore. You see a house. So there's obviously some kind of time frame that's passed since that other story. And just as a side issue, you know, we typically show that there's three wise men in our manger scenes and all. Well, the scripture doesn't say anything about three. Only there's three gifts given, but there's, you don't really know how many wise men there are. So just in the, uh, a timeline here, you can see that the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary in the sixth month and also appeared to Joseph. And then, <clears throat> of course, Joseph and Mary go to Bethlehem to register for the tax, and Jesus is born. And then sometime a little later, the Magi arrive in Jerusalem, you know, they would have had to have stayed to, to consecrate Jesus after 40, 40 days after his birth anyway, so they probably stayed at least that amount of time. Um, but then the Magi arrive and tell Herod about the king of the Jews being born, and that's when he sends out the decree to kill all the boys two years and younger. And so Joseph and Mary and Jesus escape to Egypt, and then after Herod dies, uh, not very far in the future, they return back to Nazareth where they originally were from. So who were the Magi? You know, we get the Greek word magos comes from Magi, and that's where we get our term magic a lot of times. And there certainly were, you know, magicians and charlatans and those kind of people that were around in that, in that culture during, during that time. But these guys weren't that. They were very wise people. They were astronomers of the day. The, the, king, uh, the kings that, that had Magi in their courts, I mean, they were very well prized. Um, and this was a hereditary priesthood. It passed down from father to son. So it was a very tight clique, if you will. And that's why they were so mad when Daniel kept, came in. If you remember that story where uh, the king put Daniel in charge of the Magi because of his wisdom. Well, they were, you know, incensed by that because they were in their hereditary priesthood. You know, this wasn't this, from this pagan guy in their, in their minds, you know, being put in charge of them was, was uh, blasphemy, really. Um, and apparently, uh, during some of the research, it, it shows that, that Daniel entrusted to them, you know, a, a prophecy about this star that would produce, that would, that would bring about the Messiah, uh, announce the Messiah coming. So, um, so pretty, pretty interesting things there. You see in the map, if you can here, so Babylon is right around in, in this, this area. And if you can see this little red line that follows near the coast and, and much of the water down to Jerusalem down here. You know, that's around a 1,000 miles, so it's a, it's a long journey. And also uh, keep in mind, too, that these guys uh, were going into, they were basically risking their life because they were going into Jerusalem, which was uh, governed by the Romans at the time, and they were at war with the Parthians. And, I mean, it was a very violent political time, and so these, these guys were, were pretty much, uh, very much in danger doing what they did. So they had to be pretty highly motivated. So then we see this, this character, Herod. And he called himself the king of the Jews, even though he actually wasn't even a pure Jew himself. And he was hated by everybody. Uh, the Jews didn't like him because he was so ruthless and he wasn't even a pure Jew. And he was a, a puppet of the Romans. And the Roman, Romans hated him just because uh, he was, you know, basically a traitor to his own people. And one of the centurions had even was, uh, heard saying that it's safer to be a sow than a son in Herod's household because he even killed one of his sons because of, uh, he thought he was going to try to take over his throne. So 
a very ruthless person. And it's interesting, when the Magi come in, they say, well, where's the king of the Jews? Well, everybody knew in the whole world that, that Herod referred to himself as the king of the Jews, so it was really a slap in his face. But he ignored that because he needed to know what the Magi knew. And, of course, the Magi explained to him what they saw with the star, and, and then Herod went to the chief priest, and they said, okay, he's going to be born down in Bethlehem someplace, but that's the best we can uh, discern where he's supposed to be. So um, Herod, you know, that's when he had the babies two years and younger uh, killed. So it's a very uh, violent person. And, and again, the key thing is Herod's ignorance gives us a clue about the star. Whatever the star was, it wasn't a very obvious event. So from the scripture we read, in Matthew chapter 2 in particular, it says whatever the Magi saw, it indicated them you know, a birth, a kingship, and a Jewish nation. And it also said that the star must rise in the east. So we're getting some clues about what this star is. And the star appeared at the exact time. And Herod didn't know the star that the star had appeared. He had to ask. And then we saw also when Herod asked him to go search diligently for the young child, and he said, well, so that he can go worship him. Well, that was a lie. He wanted to kill him is what it was. Um, but when that Magi had departed, it says the, saw, the star which they saw in the east went before them until it came and stood over where the young child was. So that's pretty amazing things. So the star endured over a considerable time, and the star went ahead of them, and then it actually stopped over the location of the child. And that's, that sounds pretty amazing, but I'm going to show you um, with the astronomy that actually that did happen. So what are these potential star objects that we have? Of course, we've all probably seen meteors, you know, but they kind of streak across the sky, and they're, they're gone within a few seconds. <clears throat> Novas and comets, um, they do persist for a while, but they, uh, and they do rise in the east. Uh, but other cultures around also documented various you know, celestial events, especially like the Chinese. Uh, but there's no documentation of any nova or comet that, that was around. So there's probably not any of those objects. But <clears throat> when the Magi explained you know, what, he, what they saw and why they were there, you know, Herod took murderous action. And we're going to start looking in the sky over the Middle East around 3 B.C., and the reason we're going to start at, one, at 3 B.C. is because we know from Josephus' writings that, you know, Jesus would have been born around 1 B.C. Well, if Herod said, I'm going to, I want to kill the boys two years and younger, we're adding two more years, 3 B.C., to give us a full uh, spectrum of, of time to be looking through. And there's definitely something that occurred there. So <clears throat> there's one last object we hadn't talked about just yet, and we're going to start in the Jewish New Year of 3 B.C., So let's look at our software here. So you can see we're on September 9th of 3 BC. This would be known as Rosh Hashanah. That's the new year uh, for the Jewish people. And we're in Iraq, which is where Babylon would have been. And if you can see here, we're looking towards the east, just as they said. And if we rotate forward in time, we see Jupiter rising in the east and actually see a new moon right there which is uh, actually exactly what it, what it should be for uh, the Rosh Hashanah and so Jupiter um, worldwide is known as the king planet you know the world was very mythological in those days and uh, still is to some extent but Jupiter is known as the king planet and if you can see there's a little small dot right underneath Ju Jupiter I want you to see what that is So there's a star called Regulus. Well, Regulus is actually known as, the, as a king star. So you have a king planet in conjunction with a king star. And a conjunction is just when two objects in the sky are very close in proximity to each other. They might be millions of miles in distance apart from each other, but in, in angular distance-wise, they're right on top of each other. And that was the case here with Jupiter and Regulus. And this particular event happens about every 12 years for uh, this area of the world. So it wasn't an uncommon thing, but it was uh, something that might get their attention. And so we see this 
this uh, Jupiter king planet and Regulus king star in conjunction on Rosh Hashanah, uh, the Jewish New Year. And it's actually a pretty tight conjunction, less than half a degree, so you wouldn't even have been able to tell uh, the objects apart very, very close. And if you've ever seen Jupiter in the, in the night sky, I mean, Jupiter and Venus are the, the two most brightest stars or, 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 or objects in the sky besides the sun and the moon. So very, very bright conjunction there. <clears throat> so like I said, Roman mythology says Jupiter is a king, is the king planet, known as the king planet. Regulus, the Babylonians call it Sharu, which means king. Romans call it Rex, which means king. So, of course, you've got to have more than just a kingly name to, to get the Magi's attention. It's going to have to do something pretty peculiar in it, and, uh, and it does. So let's just go back to the software. And this is a very rare event. What I want you to watch is, is Jupiter is going to come across, and you're going to see it have a conjunction with Regulus, and that'll be the first conjunction that we just saw with our other, other slide. But then watch what it does after it passes. It comes back to the second conjunction and then a third conjunction. So that was a very rare event um, uh, that, that would have occurred. So that would have gotten their attention for sure at that point. So we have a triple conjunction with the king planet and the king star. Pretty amazing thing. Then we look in a prophecy in Genesis 49, and this is a pro prophecy about the Messiah. It says, You are a lion's cub, O Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down like a lioness. Who dares to rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he comes to whom it belongs, and the obedience of the nations is his. And we probably all heard that term, lion of Judah. That's where that, this comes from. So let's look back at our software. So we just saw that triple conjunction that was taking place. And let's look at what part of the sky that's, that's talking, that's talk, so happening in. It's all happening in the Lion of Judah constellation Leo. So now you have the king planet in a triple conjunction with the king star inside the king Lion of Judah constellation. So pretty neat there, three kings, king, king, king. But then the brightest star ever seen happens shortly thereafter. I've zoomed in a little bit more, but it's the same scenario where you're going to see Jupiter come across and do this triple conjunction with Regulus, and then we're going to see another conjunction after, the, after those conjunctions. And what I want you to notice is it's almost like God saying, look at me, you're going to see all these, uh, you're going to see the sun, the moon, other planets coming through the same field of view, and, and it's just like God saying, pay attention up here, I'm, I'm doing something. So there's that first conjunction, that second conjunction, and then that third conjunction. And then I want you to notice Venus here. It's known as the mother planet. So you have the king planet, the king star, and the mother planet. And we're going to bring it forward a little bit. And you're going to see a very tight conjunction of Jupiter, the king planet, and Venus, the mother planet. And this is a star that's never been seen before and never will be again. And that's a pretty unique, I mean, this is the unique in the whole history of the universe. It had never happened. And if the universe continues on with the same physical laws, it'll never happen again. So a one, one time thing. So a very amazing. Uh, event that's happening here. So this would have certainly got the, the Magi excited. This was one one twentieth of a degree of separation, so you wouldn't be, be able to, to tell the difference. And like I said before, these were two brightest objects in the sky besides the sun and the moon. So it would have been a very bright, it wouldn't have lasted a long time, maybe maybe 10 minutes or something like that, but if they were paying attention, which the Magi were, you know, they would have seen it. And this happened on June 17th of 2 BC at 9 p.m. Now, I contend that this is actually the, the birthday of Jesus. Remember back in, in, uh, in the Luke verse, it said that he'd be born in June when it said in the sixth month, and you fast forward nine months, that would be June. So um, we'll, we'll show more evidence for that in a second. Uh, 
but I think this is the birthday of Jesus. So there's one more character that we haven't talked about in detail just yet. <clears throat> so we saw we have Regulus as the king star, Jupiter as the king planet, Venus as the mother planet. But remember in that Luke verse, we also had Gabriel. You know, he kind of started off the whole thing. Well, Gabriel is known as the messenger angel. You know, every time you see Gabriel in scripture, he's either talking about the prediction of Jesus' birth or he's talking about his death. Um, so he's known as the messenger angel. And Mercury is known as the messenger planet. And remember the verse that said, in the, in the Luke verse, that said that, that you will be with child, which means that you're shortly to be with child. And remember the first conjunction happened on 9 September, which was Rosh Hashanah. But let's stop it right before... Instead of September 9th, which would have been right when Jupiter hit Regulus for the first conjunction, let's look at September 1st of 3 BC, and let's look at where Mercury is. And remember, Venus represents Mary. Mercury represents Gabriel. You have a very tight conjunction with Mercury and Venus representing Gabriel and Mary right there just a few days before that first conjunction when she would be in child with child. So <clears throat> the thing I want you to start to see is that everything that's happening on earth, the same things are being represented up in heaven. You know, you have these actors that are, that are happening uh, with Gabriel and Mary and Mercury and Venus are happening at the same time. The conception's happening with that first conjunction. But there's still a lot more here. So here's that eight days before the first conjunction, that Mercury and Venus in the sixth month. <clears throat> but then when you put it together with the, the brightest star ever seen with that uh, Jupiter-Venus conjunction on 17th of June, which I believe is the birthday, if you take the number of days between that first conjunction and the brightest star, which I think is his birthday, there's a 282-day time span. Well, according to medical experts, the average length of a human pregnancy is 280 days. So I think that's the amount of time that Mary was pregnant with Jesus. And then we have this other scripture. This one always um, makes my hair stand up a little bit. <laughs> this is pretty amazing here. This was written in, in probably 95 to 100 AD by Apostle John. This is in Revelation. So the Magi may not have known about this I'm not sure but uh, still amazing nonetheless so it says a great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven and a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and a crown of twelve stars on her head and she was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth then another sign appeared in heaven an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head and he, his tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth and the, strag the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. So let's look at some key words there. Of course, the child, that's talking about the Messiah. And the woman clothed with the sun, that's talking about Mary. But it says she was clothed with the sun, the moon was under her feet, 12 stars at her head, and the dragon stood in front of her. Let's go back to our software. So here we're, we're, we're back in, in Babylon, right around the time of the, of the conception of Jesus. So we're looking at that first conjunction that we already have seen. You can see Jupiter and Regulus in their conjunction inside the Lion of Judah, constellation Leo. And then look what's next, constellation is Virgo, the virgin constellation. And you see the sun is in her womb, S-U-N or S-O-N, works either way. You have the new moon at her feet. You have the 12 stars of the constellation Leo, representing the 12 tribes of Israel at her head. And then what really amazes me 
is the dragon stood in front of her with the Draco constellation. All on the day that Jesus was conceived. So there, there it is just in a summary. We're, it was on, we're on Rosh Hashanah. Moon at her feet, sun in her womb, 12 stars at her head, dragon in front of her on the day Jesus was conceived. So now what prompted the Magi to leave? That certainly would have excited them enough to, to leave. Um, you know, they've seen the king planet and the king star on the Jewish New Year, uh, the triple conjunction. They saw the brightest star ever seen with, with the Venus and Jupiter conjunction. Um, the Virgo rising, whether they saw understood that or not, I don't know, but probably did. Uh, with the sun in her womb, new moon at her feet. Um, and, of course, they probably recognized that there was, you know, the time frame of nine months there between that first conjunction and the uh, Jupiter Venus conjunction. So they would have been ready to go. But keep in mind, too, that these guys were very prized possessions of the king. You know, they, they probably had to get permission to leave and probably would have had to get all their, their food and water. They probably had servants. They probably maybe even had military es ex uh, escort. Um, you know, remember, they're going into a very hostile situation, so it's doubtful that a king would allow his prized possessions to be traipsing around in military zones like that. But even at the top speed, you know, a caravan travels about 25 miles a day, um, and it's, a, it's over 1,000 miles to Jerusalem from Babylon. So even at top speed, uh, taking off immediately, that'd be 40 days uh, to do that. And you can see in the map here, uh, you know, Jerusalem that's here, with Bethlehem uh, about five miles southwest of Jerusalem. And of course, if we remember the scripture, you know, they get to Jerusalem and they, and they ask, well, where is he born the king of the Jews? You know, they were expecting to go and give their gifts right then and there. They were expecting everybody to be worshiping the king of the Jews right there, but nobody even knows, nobody has a clue. And finally, the, the chief priests say, oh yeah, well, he's somewhere down in Bethlehem. Well, doing a little research, it turns out that it looks like there were about 500 families living in Bethlehem down at that time. So you can imagine the Magi are just kind of sitting there scratching their head. You know, what are they going to do now? They don't know where the king is. Um, you know, what, what are they going to do? So they have to turn uh, to the star. That's their only recourse. So let's see what the star is doing from the Magi's perspective in, in Jerusalem. So again, we have Jupiter up here, and we want to watch, and this is, we're in Jerusalem here, and let's look and see what it does. Okay, it stops and makes this retrograde motion, as they call it. And just to kind of explain that a little better, um, you are probably all familiar with, with this kind of scene where, uh, of the solar system where you have the sun in the center with all the planets uh, orbiting around. Of course, we don't live on the sun. You know, we live on the Earth. So what happens if you put Earth in the center and let all the planets, what their perspective is relative to the Earth? Well, they're doing all this curly Q type motion uh, relative to the Earth, and that's called retrograde motion. So this is the kind of motion that these planets are doing relative to uh, the Earth. So again, when we go back to our, our scenario here, the Magi looking up, wondering what the star is doing, and it does this retrograde motion right here at the tip. And it was kind of interesting, too, if they were actually plotting it somehow. You know, it looks like a check mark, almost like, okay, look, look, or, or an arrow or something. It's like, okay, look here. And if you notice, too, um, well, let me give you the, the next. We're going to zoom into that area. And notice we're already at December 15th of 2 BC, and I've just zoomed up into that, that uh, retrograde motion area of Jupiter. And you can notice the first number here is actually the date, and the second number is the time. So we're at 20, 21, 22. And you can see how it almost looks like it slows down. It does slow down from our perspective, but in actuality, as orbits, not. So right here at this cusp of the ellipse, you know, all planets travel in elliptical orbit. So this is right there 
Um, this is kind of akin to if you've ever been to a NASCAR race and you see this elliptical track that the race cars are going on. If the race cars are going in front of you, they're going very fast, but when they're, if you're looking down straight down the ellipse of the racetrack and they're in that corner, you know, it looks, it looks apparently like they slow down, but, but not really. So um, this is the same thing that the planets are doing. It's, it, it appears like it's slowing down. And what's interesting is it's right at the 25th of December, the 25th, 26th, 27th, right in that area is where we had the retrograde motion that would appear to have stopped over Bethlehem. So I kind of imagine that, you know, Bethlehem is actually down a hill from Jerusalem. So here they are looking out down over Bethlehem, wondering where they should go and watching the star, and then it enters this retrograde motion. And I can imagine that maybe there's a lonely house on a hill or maybe farmland with a lonely house or something like that where it enters that retrograde motion right there and would appear to have stopped for several days. And that would have been how they chose the house where Jesus was. And that would have been December 25th of, of 2 BC and why we celebrate Christmas at that time as well. So you can kind of see that, that summary of that trajectory there. So just to give a, an update on the timeline, we see that 1st of September of 3 BC, that's when Gabriel visits Mary, and then eight days later is when that first conjunction of the king planet and the king star on the Jewish New Year happens, and then also coinciding with the Virgo rising with the sun in her womb and new moon at her feet. And then nine months later, we get the birth of Jesus on the 17th of June, which corresponds uh, to that you know, uh, king planet and mother planet in the brightest star we've ever seen. And exactly 282 days later, which is uh, very reminiscent of, of uh, human pregnancy. And then at some unknown time, the Magi finally leave, and they arrive in uh, Jerusalem around late 2 BC, and they give their gifts to Jesus uh, in late December when it stops over the house and presents their gifts. And it's kind of interesting how that's reminiscent of Jesus' prayer. You know, when he's... Uh, telling us how we should pray, and it says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So it's interesting how, like I said before, that everything that's happening on earth, you know, Gabriel talking to Mary, Mary's pregnancy, you know, giving the gifts and all that, that's all going up in the skies as well. A very, very interesting thing that's, that's going on. So we see these nine attributes of the star that we had started off with from the scripture we read. There was a birth, a kingship, a Jewish nation, a rise in, rises in the east, appeared at exact time. You know, Herod didn't know. He had to ask. It endured over time. It went ahead of the Magi. It stopped. I mean, all those things have been checked. So it, it, it qualifies uh, the scripture very well. Uh, what was kind of sad point is that in Luke 19, this was you know right before Jesus was crucified, and he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. So Jesus expected the Jewish people to know that he was there. I mean, this pagan culture over in Persia and Babylon knew that he would be there, but his own people didn't. And, you know, he held them accountable for it. And you might could say, well, that's kind of a, maybe even harsh, but, but I'm going to show you how mathematically you can calculate that. And they, they should have known uh, if they had been paying attention to their scripture. So let's look 33 years later at the cross. So in Mark we read uh, some scripture about the crucifixion and it talks about in the third hour they crucified him and at the sixth hour darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour and then with a loud cry Jesus breathed his last. So we kind of have to convert that language into a more of our modern day language. The third hour is talking about 9 a.m., the sixth hour is 12 p.m. and the ninth hour is 3 p.m. Um, so we want to try to figure out a date when Jesus was crucified and see maybe what was happening in the sky. And there definitely was something going on. So we know the, the time frame. We know at 3 p.m., but what day was that? Well, we look in Scripture in Luke 19. We can see this is where Jesus is entering into Jerusalem. This is where they found the, the colt, and they put down the palm branches and, and cried out Hosanna and, and basically proclaimed him king at that point. And he, he arrives in John 12, it says he arrives in Bethany six days before the Passover. 
And of course, this is the town where Lazarus had been raised from the dead, so that's why the people were so excited to see him. You know, there was a lot of folks that didn't particularly like him, but Bethany and, and this town definitely did. So let's look at some historical evidence. So all four Gospels state that Jesus was crucified on a preparation day. Um, <clears throat> so this is a day that you have to do, that the Jews would have to do all the work because this was a day before the Sabbath and in this case also a day before the Passover. So by law, they can't do any, any work or, or any, any work that the law prohibits. And so all the cooking, cleaning, all that sort of thing had to be done on this preparation day, the day before. And according to law, this Passover always begins on twilight of the 14th of Nisan. So if we find a year when the preparation day falls on a Friday and is on the 14th of Nisan, then we, we know we're pretty, pretty getting pretty close. And also, you know, we all know that Pontius Pilate was the one that condemned Jesus, and he was procurator of Judea from 26 to 36 A.D. So we just narrowed it down to a 10 or 11 year time frame there to when his crucifixion could have happened. And there's only three dates in which that time frame, there was a preparation day that occurred on a, on a Friday. So there was the 5th of April, 26 A.D., the 3rd of April, 33 A.D., and the 6th of April, 36 A.D. And, of course, we know from our study we just did that Jesus was born on 2 B.C., and, and as, as well as Josephus' writings. And Luke says that Jesus was about 30 years old when he began his ministry, and we also know there were four documented Passovers that occurred during Jesus' ministry. So mathematically, if you take 2 B.C. is like a negative 2, you add his 30 years plus 4, and you have to add another year because there's no year 0, right? When you go from 1 B.C. to 1 A.D., uh, there's no year 0, so you have to add one. That gives you to 33 A.D. So the 3rd of April, 33 A.D., is the only date that really qualifies. And this is, to me, one of the most amazing prophecies in the whole Bible. Uh, we're not going to read all this. We're going to focus in on the, the main part we're, look, we're interested in. But this is Daniel chapter 9. I mean, a lot of secular theologians want to throw out the book of Daniel because of this verse here. Because it's, they just say it's too accurate. They don't believe in the spiritual side of things. But, um, but we know it to be true. It says, From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. And then after the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be cut off. Of course, the anointed one is talking about the Messiah. And when it talks about these sevens, that's kind of like our word for decade, you know, which means 10 years. Well, these sevens are talking about seven years. So it's saying that by the time the anointed one comes and, and this issue, between the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one comes, there's going to be 69 total sevens. And this issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, that happened uh, with Nehemiah. You can look in Nehemiah chapter 2, and King Artaxerxes gave the command to, to Nehemiah to go and rebuild Jerusalem. And we know that that happened on March 5th of 444 B.C. So using that information, we can mathematically calculate to the exact day when Jesus was crucified. Hopefully you can see that. <laughs> and it's a little bit uh, mathy there, but... But it's, it's pretty neat. Um, so here's the 69 sevens, 69 times seven, so that's 483 years. Now, anytime you look at Scripture in the Bible, uh, they always use a 360-day year. This is a Babylon. They're using the Babylonian calendar. They didn't know about our the accuracy to the years that we do. But so we have to calculate to our current day um, to be able to use our software. But the Babylonian days would, would say 483 times 360, so that gives you the 173,880 days until Jesus makes his triumphal entry. And because of our scientific means, we know it's really 365.24, so we have to convert those days to true days and true years. And we get 476.067 true years. And like I said, King Artaxerxes decreed to Nehemiah to rebuild Jerusalem on March 5th of 44. 444 B.C. So we start there, that 444 B.C. for the years. Don't worry about the remainder just yet and just add 476. Well, that gets us to 32 A.D. And then we have to add one more because there's no year zero like we had to do earlier. So that gets us to 33 A.D. 
So since we started on March 5th, 444 BC, 476 years later will give us March 5th of 33 AD. And now we, we go back and look at this remainder of 0.067 true years to determine the exact day. So 0.067 times 365.24 gives us 24.7 days. So again, ignoring the remainder for now, March 5th plus 24 gives you March 29th with a 0.7 day reminder. And so convert that to times 24 to give you the number of hours. So that gives you 5 p.m. twilight, which is actually the next day. So it turns out March 30th of 33 AD is the day of Jesus' triumphal entry. And we also saw in John chapter 12 that it says six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany. And then the next day is when he rode into Jerusalem. And so, so that means on the five days before his pa uh, the Passover, Jesus arrives in, in his triumphal entry. And of course, he was crucified the day before Passover, so that's only four days until his crucifixion. And so if you count, count up from March 30th, March 31st, April 1st, April 2nd, April 3rd. So you got four days later, April 3rd of 33 AD is confirmed with a prophecy that was written 500 years before Jesus was even born. And just to help kind of see that better, the calendar on the left is our modern day Gregorian calendar and the, on the right is the Hebrew calendar. And so here you can see this March 30th and April 3rd would have been his crucifixion day. And here you see the month of Nisan corresponding to, to this April month for us, uh, starting on the 10th of Nisan, going to the 14th of Nisan, which is when the Passover is supposed to begin at twilight. So we see this event timeline where March 5th, uh, 444 B.C., that decree by Artaxerxes was made. And we have these 69 weeks uh, in Daniel to his triumphal entry. And then a few days later, the Messiah is cut off or killed. And of course, there's the 70th week of Daniel. That's talking about the tribulation period that's uh, to appear uh, seven years in the future, or a seven-year period that's to occur in the future. Um, that's a whole other story. So now we know the date, April 3rd of 33 AD. And what happened in the sky during that time? So this is a verse in Acts. This is, talk, this is Peter talking to the Jews. And it says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, and your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams, and even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that phrase there, the moon to blood, you know, sometimes you also hear in our terminology a blood moon. And that's what's known as a lunar eclipse. <clears throat> so what is a lunar eclipse? It's just the geometry of the objects in the sky, the sun and the moon and the earth, are such that the earth is in between the sun and the moon. And so the sun's rays refract around the atmosphere of the earth and kind of impinge on the moon, causing it to be orangish reddish, just like our sunsets are a lot of times are orangish red. That same light is is on the moon that, that causes it to have that same color. And usually, especially in, the, in ancient times, that was a pretty ominous sign. So let's look at our software again. So you can see in our date here, I'm mean, using military time, but it's at one o'clock, April 3rd of 33 AD and we're looking up at the moon. And let's just play it forward, and you're going to see the moon slowly get darker. There's at 1.30. Remember, he died at 3 p.m., so now it's at 2 o'clock. At 2.30. And then right there at 3 o'clock, you have the maximum lunar eclipse at that day right at the hour of his death. And the software has the ability to, to, to fly your visually around. So we're going to go back to Jerusalem just so I can show you. I'm not trying to fool you. This really is happening.
So you're going you're to see the Earth is in front of the sun, blocking the, the sunlight, causing the lunar eclipse. As you can see there. And it's going to fly us and put us back down in Jerusalem. And you can see, hopefully you can see the vague outline there of a Virgo rising. And at the same time, twilight's happening. Remember, Passover started at twilight. They had to get Jesus off the cross before Passover or they would be unclean and they couldn't celebrate. But you can see, you know, he, when he was conceived, you had a new moon. And now you have a full moon at Virgo's feet again. So pretty, pretty ominous day. If they were paying attention, they, they probably would have been uh, pretty concerned about that. So we see that the blood moon at the hour of Jesus' death on 3 p.m. of 3rd of April, 33 A.D. Right as Passover begins, representing Jesus' death. So there's over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament at Jesus' first coming, and many more even than that for second coming. We definitely ought to be paying attention. And again, you know, I hope you can see that we press Scripture really hard. You know, we use the latest astronomy software that NASA uses. We've looked at Scripture prophecy that was written 500 years before uh, Jesus was even born, and Scripture didn't break. So if we can trust it for the physical things we can, you know, halfway understand, you know, we definitely should be... Uh, cognizant of the spiritual things that the Bible talks about, and we definitely need to be prepared for his, his coming. I know this is a lot of information, um, <clears throat> and I've created an e-book in this form. Of course, it, it would be, just email me at this address there, and I'll, I'll definitely send it to you, so um, hopefully you can uh, gain even more, it has even more insight than what I've shared here today. But uh, I'll be standing down if you want to ask me questions uh, after the service, so I appreciate your attention.